Good morning, church. I'd like to thank the Borgs for the scripture reading and Sister Bullock for that wonderful song. My Jesus, hold fast to my soul. I am helpless without your control. That was beautiful. I don't have a lot of time today, saints, but we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna jump right into it. This is a message that has become dear to my heart. A lot of it comes straight from the desire of ages. For those that are struggling with spirit of prophecy, this is not an attempt, as they say, to bash it or to shove it down your throat, but we're gonna show here today from Spirit of Prophecy and from our Bible that they do go hand in hand, amen? amen. Bow your heads with me, please, and for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your kindness and your mercy towards us, your children. We have seen through our Sabbath school lesson this week, Heavenly Father, for through studies, how you are with Abraham and how you put your hedge of protection over Abraham, how you put your hedge of protection over your people, Lord. And we thank you for that hedge of protection that you offer us, Lord. And we ask for your strength that we don't do anything to step outside of it. We ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit here now, Heavenly Father. Remove me from me, Lord, that your words and your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Satan is playing a game of life for every soul. He knows that patriarchal uh, sympathy or practical sympathy is a test of purity and unselfishness of the heart. And he will make every possible effort to close our hearts to the needs of others that we may finally be unmoved by the sight of suffering. He will bring in many things to prevent the expression of love and sympathy. It is thus that he ruined Judas. Judas was constantly planning to benefit self. In this, he represents a large class of professed Christians today. Therefore, we need to study his case. The prophet of God says, we need to study his case. And this is what we're going to do here today, church. We are as near to Christ as he was. Yet if, as with Judas, association with Christ does not make us one with him, if it does not cultivate within our hearts a sincere sympathy for those whom Christ gave his life. Who did Christ give his life for? All, all. This is a message of love. And just throughout the Bible continually, we just see God's love shining and God's people with such a lack of love for one another and a lack of love for the world. And he is continuing to say that association with him is not enough if we don't love one another. We are in the same danger as Judas of being outside of Christ, the sport of Satan's temptation. Have mercy. Judas was constantly planning to benefit self. There is no room for self in ministry. In, in ministry. There is no room for self. It is arrogant and dangerous for us to constantly think and look for greater position. Judas didn't just end up throwing those coins on the ground though. It was a building process. This was something that he was struggling with his whole life. And so we're gonna look at this, 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 this whole concept and see how he became or brought himself to, to betray his Lord. And it's so important as we look here and we see how it says he will bring in many things to prevent the expression of love and sympathy. It is this that he ruined Judas. Judas was constantly trying to benefit self. We are as near to Christ as he was, just like it says. 
Too often we look at Judas and we make a grave mistake. We think that Christ didn't love Judas as much as he loved the other disciples. And that's not true. He loved that brother. And I think he worked with that brother even more to retain his heart. He knew Jesus, Jesus studied scripture. He knew Jesus was, uh, Judas was going to betray him. But even knowing the betrayal that was going to come from Judas, he continued to work with Judas and work with Judas and try to bring Judas out of this as he continues to work with us and work with us and try to bring us out of a life of sin. Amen? Amen. Listen to this description, though. The history of Judas... No, 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 no. Let me go back. Listen to this description. We're going to see here... She says here... I'm going to go back. Uh, many Judas was constantly... Mm -hmm. Judas was constantly trying to benefit self. In this, he represents a large class of professed Christians today. That struck me very hard. So this is why our sister is saying we need to study his case. So how does he look like us today? A large class, not just some, a large class of Christians today. So let's take a close look at Judas and see if we don't see ourselves in Judas. Judas felt in his own person the evidence of Christ's power. He recognized the teachings of Christ as superior to all that he had ever heard. He loved the great teacher. I want to put emphasis on that. He loved the great teacher because many people think that you, won't, that, that you, you can lose out on heaven or if you lose out on heaven, you didn't love God. This is saying he loved the great teacher and desired to be with him. He felt the desire to be changed in character and in life, and he hoped to experience this through connecting himself with Jesus. The Savior did not uh, repulse Judas. He gave him a place among the 12, so, so he, and he endowed him with power. So here we see that, that Judas loved Jesus. Here we see that he, that, that he saw the teachings of Jesus far superior than any that he'd ever heard. How many of you love Jesus tonight? How many of you, you uh, find his teachings far superior than any of you, any, any you've ever heard? And how many of you want to be converted and, 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 and want that conversion to come through the connection of Jesus Christ? That was Judas. So we need to be careful how we look. We need to be careful how we smirk and we need to be even more careful how we look at those that are lost. It's time we take a deep look at ourselves tonight. God says probation is closing, and he says that the majority of professed Christians are just like Judas. He endowed him with the power to heal the sick, to cast out devils. But Judas did not come to the point of surrendering himself fully to Christ. He did not give up his worldly ambitions or his love of money. While he accepted the position of ministry to Christ, he did not bring himself under a divine molding. He felt that he could retain his own judgment and opinions and cultivated a disposition to criticize and accuse. If people didn't do it his way, we're going to see through scripture, he was always trying to counsel God. He thought, he knew. And it's dangerous for us to think that we have a grasp on this full, this full doctrine. We need to constantly be studying and constantly be praying. Christ knew when he permitted Jesus to connect with the 12 that Judas was possessed with the demon of selfishness. Spirit of prophecy calls it the demon of avarice. In other words, a demon-possessed man came to Christ and Christ did not cast out that demon. Now, why would he do that? See, we have to stop playing. 
Jesus, e e even deep down inside, when it lurks in our heart to hang on to that darkness, Jesus won't force it no matter what. He won't force it. So he knew Judas was not going to let this go. But he permitted him to have a place among the 12 and kept him close. Christ knew he had the demon of selfishness and he knew he would betray him. And yet he did not separate him from other disciples or send him away. He was preparing their minds for the minds of men for his death and ascension. And he foresaw that if he dismissed Judas, Satan would have used Judas to spread reports that would have been difficult to explain. So he kept him close. Judas was the only one that Christ did not pick. The other disciples regarded Judas. He was the only one that Christ did not handpick. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew exactly what he wanted. Soon as he came in, Jesus told him, he said, hey, foxes have holes and, and, and birds uh, and fo uh, fowls of the air have, have a, a nest, but the son of man have nowhere to lay his head. He was telling Jesus, right, uh, Judas right off, hey, I know what you want. I know why you're here. And I'm not here, don't, I hope you're not here for riches because I don't have that. I don't have a house. I don't have a man. My mansion is in heaven. But Judas didn't get that. Amen? But it's interesting to see the way that Jesus worked with Judas. After telling him, foxes have holes. Fowls and birds of the air have somewhere to lay their nest. The son of man, the son of man, he has nowhere to lay his head. But he knew Judas was all about the money. So where did he put Judas? In the treasury. Amen. So we, so we need to understand, is this not how the, world, the, the Lord works with us? You have a problem in your life, lying, but yet you find yourself in situa sticky situations all the time. Why am I always in these situations? Maybe the Lord's trying to get you to tell the truth. He's going to put you in the fire. I have a problem smoking? Funny why I'm driving down the street and I'm seeing the Marlboro man on every billboard and, and, and I'm constantly around friends and people who are constantly smoking. Why is that? He's trying to get you to quit it. He's going to put you in the fire. It's not a bring and everything's okay. No. We have to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. Amen? Amen. By connecting ourselves with Christ. Now, the Savior knew that Judas, if dismissed, would misconstrue and mystify his statements, that the Jews would accept a false version of his word, using this version to bring terrible harm to the disciples and to leave on the minds of Christ's enemies that the impression that Jews were justified and taking the attitude that they did towards Jesus and his disciples. So Christ did not send Judas from his presence, but kept him by his side where he could counteract the influence that might been exerted against his work. Let's look at the history of Judas. This is also Desire of Ages, page 716. The history of Judas presents a sad ending of life that might have been honored of God. Had Judas died before his last journey to Jerusalem, he would have been regarded as a man worthy of a place among the 12 and one who would be greatly missed the adherence which has followed him through the centuries would not have existed for the attributes revealed at, attributes revealed at the close of history, but it was for a purpose that his character was laid open to the world. It was to be a warning to all who, like him, should betray a sacred trust. I, I heard a pastor one time say, what a loving God we serve because he tells us all, amen? Yeah. It's funny when you, you, you go to a funeral uh, of anyone, you hear nothing but the good stuff. Oh, he was a wonderful guy. He did this for the, for the church and he, he did. You hear nothing but good. But the Lord, see, he loves his people so much, he lays it out. He laid it all out for us, the good and the bad so that we can see the mistakes of others and, and, and see the, the good of others and how they clung to God and how he carried them through and we can see where they fell as well so that we don't trip up. That's the God that we serve, amen? 
Judas had a natural and strong love for money, but he had not always been corrupt enough to do such a deed as this. He had fostered the evil spirit of avarice and his greed until it had become the ruling motive of his life. The love of mammon overbalanced his love for Christ. Through becoming the slave of one vice, he gave himself to Satan to be driven to any length of sin. One device be driven to any length of sin. This is why the Bible says the ax must hit the root, right? If we look at our personal life very closely, there's, only, there's really only one thing that we need to get to, one root. And when the ax hits that root, all the other sins go away. Now, yeah, we may have a lot of problems in our life and a lot of things that we're struggling with, but when you travel down that, that, you know, that, that branch, it comes down to one thing. And in this church, a lot of it is our diet. With you, it might be something else. But this is why we need to be praying and, and constantly fasting and asking the Lord to show us what it is that we, what it is about us that we need to have removed. And we can do a lot of that through praying and fasting and studying the life of Christ. Studying the life of Christ is like a divine POTUS. If you understand the medical missionary term, uh, POTUS, it's like a, it's like a paste that, that, that you put on and it draws. So as you study the life of Christ, it begins to draw everything to the surface. So when it comes to the surface, you can finally see it and you say, yes, Lord, there it is. Take it. And he'll take it and reroute you and move you in another direction. Amen. And this is what he was trying to do with Judas. Jesus said, Jesus said don't call me the Christ. Christ often repeated statements that his kingdom was not of this world offended Judas. See, Judas had his own agenda, always. So when Christ would say, my kingdom's not of this world, Judas was upset because Judas knew this was the Christ. This was the king. And they were under Roman rule for so long, they wanted to rise up from Roman rule and begin to rule over this nation. But, but God's not worried about that. My, my, my world is not of this kingdom. And so, and, and when, Jesus, when Jesus would make these statements, it offended Judas. He had marked out a line upon which he expected Christ to work, to which he expected Christ to work. He had planned that John the uh, Baptist should be delivered from prison, but lo, John was left to be beheaded. And Jesus, instead of asserting his royal right and avenging the death of John, retired with the disciples into a country place. Judas wanted more aggressive warfare. He wanted Jesus to snap too, hurry up and show your royalty because he wanted to rise his, ride his coattails to the top. He had his own agenda. Jesus said, don't call me the Christ because he knew that they were looking for this king. They knew, they knew he was the son of David and everybody remembered what a warrior David was. This is why he said, don't call me the Christ. They had so much hatred and bitterness in their hearts that they were the chosen generation, but what were they chosen to do? They were the oracles of God. God didn't love them more than he loved the world, but they were chosen to deliver Christ to the world. And by showing the world Christ, they would have dropped their false gods, amen, and they would have worshiped the God of heaven, just like Abraham did. Abraham was a mighty man of God to have his own army. Abraham would go out and defeat other armies. And Abraham was so loyal and he was so dedicated and he was so devoted that other people, that they stood up and took notice of his life and other nations began worshiping the God of heaven because of Abraham's life. This was supposed to be the job of, 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 of the Israelites. This was their job. Abraham was very devoted in the way that he handled his business. And other nations <clears throat> bowed down to the God of Abraham because of his life. This is what God desired of his people. But there was no real difference in their life whatsoever. There was no real difference. They would look just like the world. 
And as, as they went forward looking just like the world other than a special ceremony time or a high Sabbath, but other than that, they look just like the world. And, Jesus, and at this dark hour and time of them misrepresenting God, Jesus came to deliver them. And when he came to deliver them, they received him not. And here John the Baptist is all by himself in a dungeon about to be beheaded. And Judas is mad because Judas is looking for temporal gain. He's looking for a position. He wants to be exalted. See, when he first began to turn on Jesus uh, in John chapter 6, um, actually, let, turn in your Bibles with me to Luke 10. We'll see when he first started to turn on Jesus, you're going to see Judas was a part of the 70. God had 70 disciples that were going out before him. So turn with me to Luke 10, and we're going to see where Judas began to turn on Jesus. Got a couple Bible verses in here, so we're going to move right through them. Okay, starting at 1, Luke 10, 1. Does everyone have it? Amen. Amen. After these things, the Lord appointed another, the other 70 also and sent them to and two before his face. So they did groundwork for Jesus. Jesus sent them two and two before his face. So before Jesus goes into a city, he sends the 70 in and they go do groundwork. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye before the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers in his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lamb amongst wolves. So we see that he sent the 70 out ahead of him before he came. Now in, in, in verses 4 through 16, this is just all, this is Jesus instructing them on what he wanted them to do. Amen. This is Jesus telling them, hey, don't take any clothes with you. Don't even take a second pair of shoes with you. Just go forth and do the work and trust on me. I will take care of you. So coming down into 17, we see the 70, they're coming back excited. It says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto, unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The work of the Lord will save you, brothers and sisters. It's not what you're going forth and doing for others. You're not doing anything. The Lord is doing it through you. You're just being a vessel. But the work of the Lord will save you. And this is what he's trying to get them to understand. This is what he's trying to get them to see. But they're subject to the power that they see. Even the devils tremble when we come because of your name. So here... God is telling them, he saw Satan fall like lightning. Don't rejoice in that. So let's go back to John. I'm sorry. That was just a, a showing of, of John chapter 6. If you'll follow me, please, back to John chapter 6. Now here we see in Luke 10, they're excited. They're excited and, and they're coming back just on fire because demons are running because from their name. And then not far after that, we see here in John chapter 6, look in verse 41, we're just going to touch on there. Now they're already murmuring against Jesus. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. So he has given them the power. They've seen Jesus cast, um, I mean, raise people from the dead. They have cast out demons in his name. They've healed the sick in his name. They've blessed people, they've baptized, and they've done all this work. But they still can't accept the message. You have to have a faith, church, that you cannot take lightly. We have to be rooted. Everything that they saw, 
and they began to murmur. And in 51, here it is, he's saying it again. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And if that bread will I give it is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the work. And then moving down to 55 through 71, he says, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. He's trying to tell them this is not the bread you're used to. Not even the manna, the special bread, I, ra I rained down from heaven. The living bread, eat of me, and you will live forever. And, and these things, the synagogue, these men, they were saying, this is a hard saying. They couldn't get past that. After all Jesus had done for them, after the walk that they did, they still couldn't get past that. And Judas was the one in the midst of them kicking up all this drama was the one, are you, what? Because he still knew that this was the savior, but when he, he, he stepped to the side and, and, and he would watch from afar. And he was constantly cultivating to criticize and, uh, criticize and accuse. Here in 66, it says, but there are some of you, here in 64, there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of the Father. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked no more with them. So the 70 left. They dispersed. And Judas kicking up all this, uh, all this, this critical and accusing and, 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 and stirring them up, he didn't leave. He blended in with the 12. Then said Jesus unto the 12, will ye also go? Now he's not really talking to the 12, he's looking at Judas. He sees Judas blend with the 12 and he says, are you going to Judas? You're with them, you believe them, right? So why are you not going? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure whew, that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered them, have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. In other words, Judas was, uh, was a part of the 70 complaining. Judas was a part of the 70 trying to counsel God. But when the 70 left, he didn't leave. He blended in with the 12. But then Peter comes, always boastful, you know, Lord, where are we going to go without you? He really saved Judas because Jesus was looking at Judas saying, why are you not leaving? But then Judas jumped, or, 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 or Peter, Simon Peter jumps out there with that comment, and I'm glad he did. Because that's a very important piece of scripture. And I think about that every time the road gets rough. Every time things get tough, where else will I go? I'm not getting off. There's no other way but by Christ, and I'm not getting off. And I hope you don't either. So we see Judas continually cultivating uh, 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 this and misconstruing Jesus' words and, 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 and working this, this disbelief of, amongst the 70 and now into the 12. Now turn with me, please, uh, to Matthew chapter 26. That's why the, the prophet of God said we must study his case, and that's what we're doing here today, saints. Matthew chapter 26, 26, 6. And let's pick this up in Matthew 26 as you turn. The name of Judas meant Jehovah lives. Uh, and, and God's people always named their children with meaning so, that, so they wouldn't forget certain principles. Daniel was God is my judge. Judas meant Jehovah lives. Iscariot was a group of very wealthy people uh, and, 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 and that Judas came from. See, he came from money. He always had it natural uh, to be able to handle money. 
but he allowed himself uh, to, to foster this, this, this greed, dipping in the pot, feeling he wasn't getting enough. Now here in Matthew 26, verse six, uh, it reads, now then Jesus said to Bethany in the house of Simon, see, we, we see him coming into uh, to the house, uh, uh, and, and he came into him and the woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when the disciples saw, they had indignation saying, what purpose is this? For this ointment might have been sold uh, for much and given to the poor. Now see, this was Judas. Looking at this woman coming in with this ointment and anointing Jesus' feet with this ointment and the odor, just, it filled the room. It's a beautiful odor as she anointed his feet. Now Judas just didn't speak out. He wasn't that kind of churchman. So he, he leans over and whispers, Peter, look at this. What, what, what great waste is this? This, this, could have been, this could have been sold and given to the poor. Judas didn't care anything about poor. But when he started that, it began to go around. Yeah, you're, you're right. Look at this. And now he's saying it to another disciple, and, and, and it's starting to circulate around the room. And Jesus felt this thing coming in. And Jesus says here in verse 10, when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, why trouble you this woman? For she hath wrought a good work unto me. For ye have the poor with you always, but me you have not always. For in she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told as a memorial of her. When Jesus checked Judas right then, Judas felt rebuked. He felt rebuked. And that gave him the gumption to go off and betray his savior. Because you're going to see right here in 14, just jump right down. Right there in 14. Then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests and said unto them, what will you give me? Judas felt rebuked. Trying to counsel God. Knew he had it his way. And God correct the poor you have with you always. What this woman does, she's anointing me for my burial. They didn't even have a clue he was going to die. Judas is still waiting and working out his will, waiting for Jesus to come and reveal his royal right so that he can reign with him. And Judas felt rebu rebuked. Now, she took that bottle, which was a $10,000 bottle, and poured it on the, head, on the feet of Jesus and began to anoint him. And, 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 and it's important that we look at it the way that John says it in John chapter, John chapter 12. Because uh, in John chapter 12, turn with me to John chapter 12, because by this supper, every one of the disciples, they, 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 they should have been locked in. They should have believed. So here in John chapter 12, They should have been locked in in their faith, knowing exactly what was going on, but they were, they were still wavering. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover to Bethany, uh, where, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, uh, whom raised him from the dead, there they made him a supper of Martha served. But Lazarus, one of them that sat at the table with him and took Mary a pound of ointment, spikener, very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor and anointment. Then saith, Jesus, uh, uh, then saith one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, to Simon, Simon's son, which should betray him. It was Judas who started all of that. Judas was the one who said, what a great waste this was. And this, this should be a testament to us. We have to be careful the messages that we see from, from people who claim to love God as much as we do. Amen? They just start sowing little seeds. What grace waste is this? And, and after all the things that were going on, it was a struggle already because they were, they were looking to kill Jesus if you read on. 
They were looking to kill Jesus because he had done these miracles and they're looking to kill Lazarus too. They said, we must kill Jesus and we must kill Lazarus. And everybody in that room knew it. And they knew the severity of the times that they were living in. But Judas, still there, cultivating this disposition to criticize and accuse. Have mercy. Matthew 26. If you'll turn with me, please. Matthew 26, uh, 17 through 19. And we'll begin to close this up. In Matthew 26, 17 and 19. See, Jesus, Jesus was working with Judas. He was truly did everything that he possibly could to save Judas. He didn't tell you, you see, when it came to the, the Last Supper, he didn't even tell them where he was going. He just, they asked him, Judas was, was cultivating, telling them, hey, ask Jesus where we're going. And he was hoping that Jesus would say, well, we're going to 21st Street, and that's where we're going to eat, and then he can go and sell Jesus out. But Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't fall for that. Jesus said, go into the town, and when you see a man with a vase on his head, ask him. But see, Jesus knew exactly where he was going. That's how he was able to meet them there. But in Matthew 26, verses 17, uh, uh, verses 17 through 19, it says, Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. Right there. Jesus is not giving it to him completely. Now we're here. Now we're at the Passover. See, a lot of people think at this Passover meal, they just had the bread and the wine. They had a big dinner. They had a big supper. And through all this, Jesus had been working with Judas. He'd been working with this brother and working with this brother and working with this brother. And they sat down at a meal and they began, to, they began to just talk as friends, you know? They had such a tight relationship, I can only imagine just, just them sharing what they had been through in the last three and a half years together. These men had walked across country with no clothes on their back, no food, just completely trusting in the Lord. And they began to talk. In, in, in this room and, 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 and then Jesus got up and he girded himself with a towel and I'm sure the whole atmosphere changed and the disciples in John chapter uh, John chapter 13 and he slowly and methodically began to wash his disciples feet now here at the last leg of the battle we're at the closing moments of the battle, and it's amazing. It's amazing how probation can close on even the Christian here in church. Often it closes on the Christian at, an, at the hour of decision, and he puts that decision off, and puts that decision off, not knowing that it'll never come around again. Even the great Lisbon earthquake, thousands died in church praying so all we have to do is think about when we came in here what was our attitude like when we came to church when they called the garden of prayer were you really communing with God in John chapter 13 John chapter 13, 1 and 2, he says, Now before the feast, the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, he should depart out of us the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. The supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. See, the word heart right there, it meant the center of his life. In other words, there's a final war about to take place. Three, 
Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper, laid aside the garment, and took a towel and girded himself. Now he girds himself and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. He thought about the, he, he started with one and slowly and methodically began to wash his feet. And then he moved on to Judas. And the prophet of God says that when he moved on to Judas and he took that towel to wash his feet, he lingered. He lingered and he took his time. And as he washed his feet and talked to him, and work with this brother, Judas became convinced, completely convicted on what he was getting ready to do and knew that he should not do it. He probably thought about the loving, how loving Christ had always been. He thought about how Christ never exposed him to anyone else. It was not Christ's method to expose people. Christ tried to shield, to win, to edify and exalt. He thought about these wonderful times over the past three and a half years and he got to the point where the prophet of God said he became convicted about what he was about to do and knew exactly that he should not do it. But he did. Then they got up and sat down at the table and they started having the bread and wine after the foot washing and they had bread and wine after foot washing. The Bible says the multitude upon multitude in the valley of decision. Judas was in the valley of decision. Judas, Satan had put that thought in the center of his heart and it was the most keen thing on his mind. And when he became convicted, instead of surrendering and turning over the right, he contemplated and contemplated it. And now we see the scene change. Notice what it says in the Bible in John chapter 13 beginning at 21. See, he's wrestling in his mind. In John 13, beginning at 21, uh, the Bible says, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in his spirit and testified. Now, Jesus is troubled in his spirit, troubled in his spirit. Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciple looked to one another, doubting who, who he spake of. And notice, they began to say, is it I? Is it I, Lord? They weren't saying, is it him? They were looking in at themselves. In Matthew, it says, is it I? But he says, no one there was leaning on, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of the disciples who Jesus loved. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoning to him that he should ask who it, who it was that would betray him. He then, laying on Judas' breast, saith unto him, Lord, is it I? Jesus answered, he it is, to whom I dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, there's a picture here. It, 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 it's, it's funny how Judas didn't even see that because he was wrestling. And everyone is saying, Lord, is it I? Is it I? And Judas, he, he, he's not even there. He's not even paying attention because he's wrestling. And just like a Christian that sleep in church, amen, when the appeal is given at, at the end and, and everyone stands up and you wake up and you, you just stand because everybody else is standing, right? And so now Judas said, well, is it I? And Jesus said, you said it, Judas. You said it. What you do, do quickly. What you do, do quickly. Now, Jesus wasn't telling him to quickly go out and sell me out. Jesus, Jesus is working with this brother even still. He's trying to tell him, confess this thing. What you do, do quickly, Judas. I know. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're about to do. Confess this thing. I'll treat you like I did the demoniac. I'll take that, I'll wipe this thing out. All you have to do is confess it. But Judas didn't confess. Jesus was troubled while this brother was wrestling. And let this be a testament to us. When Jesus asks you to do something, there's nothing to wrestle about. Just do it. Just do it. Throw your hands up in the Lord and say, Lord, save me lest I perish. But do it. There's nothing to wrestle about. 
God said, Judas, what you do, do quickly. But Judas grabbed that sack of money, slipped out the door, and the Bible says it was midnight. The Greek says the dark hour. He walked out and the scene changed. Bringing it back to Matthew 27. I want to go back to Matthew 27 and watch how the scene changed. In Matthew 27, starting at verse 3, then Judas, which had been betrayed him, then he saw that was, con was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to, the, what is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down those 30 pieces of silver, uh, those 30 pieces of silver at the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Those 30 pieces of silver represent cherished sin tucked away. That money meant everything to Judas. It meant everything to Judas. But when he saw his savior betray, it meant nothing. When it didn't go the way he thought it was going to go. See, Judas walked closely and he told them to bind Jesus when he was in the garden. Bind him tight. And he told the, the guards that specifically for his own game. Because he thought as soon as they bound Jesus, he would break free. And he can just say, hey, I told you to bound him tight. And he can walk away from this. Judas would, Jesus would have to exert his royal right. And Judas would be there to reap the benefits. But when, he, when they led Jesus away, he was amazed. He could not believe Jesus went with them. And as he followed behind, close in those halls, and he watched them slap him and torture them and mock him and make fun of him and prophesy, who, who smiteth thee, O God? He began to feel guilty. It started to hit him, and he started to know, I betrayed my Savior out. This was not playing in the way that he figured it was going to go. And he, he knew what he did and he ran into that hall, threw that sack of money at the floor of the high priest. See, the high priest at that time, that represents Jesus. He's our high priest, is he not? Amen. Jesus is our high priest. And him throwing that sack of money, what meant so much to him, it, it, that, that, that just it immediately remind me, have mercy of the, say, the second coming. When Jesus comes back again, and you have this tucked sin in your heart that you have not given up. And you immediately, what you love so much, that, that darkness that lurks down within you, that you love so much, it's going to mean nothing to you when the Lord comes. It will mean nothing to you in the judgment. And you're going to throw that thing down at the foot of the high priest and say, take it, Lord. And he's going to say, I'm sorry. I can't do nothing for you now. There's no blood left. There's no blood to blot out the sins. Judas ran from the hall screaming, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. Three times screaming after he sold his savior out. Now the scene drastically changes. They're leading Jesus down to his crucifixion. Later that same day, on the road from Pilate's Hall to Calvary, there came an interruption among the, the shouts and the jeers of the wicked throng who were leading Jesus to the place of crucifixion. As they passed the retired spot, they saw at the foot of a lifeless tree the body of Judas. It was the most revolting sight his weight had broken the cord by which he had hanged himself to the tree and falling. His body had been horribly mangled and dogs were now devouring him. Jesus looked over and saw that scene on his way to Calvary. And seeing that, he buckled and he fell. Dogs devouring the flesh of one of his disciples. He had worked with that brother and worked with that brother and worked with this brother. We see Simon Peter who had betrayed Jesus and said he never would.
But after he betrayed him and he looked in the Savior's loving eyes, he, he, he began to weep. And he ran off to pray. But Judas, still trying to counsel God and have it his own way, running and throwing himself at the foot of the priest. And then actually screaming and telling Jesus, save yourself. Now you know that was a demon. Telling Jesus to save himself so all of us would be lost? Still trying to counsel God. And then ran out screaming, it's too late. It's too late. And hung himself on a dead tree. Or did the tree die? I do not want that to be my report. It's too late. It's not too late for us, brothers and sisters. It is not too late for us. We are living in the last days and time. We know this and we've known it for a while. We see the Pope on his way here and you know Sunday observance is going to be the hot topic. Listening to this brother's speeches it's like opening up the great controversy and reading it yourself. The last thing he, I remember him saying, his last speech he gave, he was excited about how the world is coming together. All the churches are seeming to come together. He said, but those evangelicals, we still have to work on those evangelicals. I got shivers down my arms when he said that straight out of the spirit of prophecy. Saints, don't let this be your report. It's too late. It's too late. If we want to rid ourselves from the inside out, if you choose God today, please stand with me for a closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being a God who knows how to lead his people. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for your message that you continue to give us, Lord, for your warnings that you continue to give us, for your word that you give us that if we only study. You said we have a more sure word, Lord, more sure than an eye account. Thank you, Lord, for continuing to work with us, for your patience with each and every one of us. I pray that you strengthen everyone here, Heavenly Father. Strengthen their hearts and their minds. Lord, that as we walk away, this is not just a message that we heard today, Lord, but we walk away with a new mind and a new attitude, Heavenly Father, and a willingness to go forth and do your work and to sin no more. That we cling to you, Lord, every minute of every day. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.